So if you can, bow your head and close your eyes and let's pray. Father God, in Jesus' name, we are thanking you for the honor and the privilege it is to come in your name to declare healing against our members that are having challenges. Father God, I hold up the Beckers, specifically Neil, Father God, who's in the hospital. You know his heart. You know who he is and you know him by name and you've designed his body you've designed everything about him and I thank you for the doctors that are treating him right now but I pray for the healer to show up Jesus Christ and set him free from all ailments father God we come against every member every request everyone that is entreating the Lord of the harvest to come and we make a declaration that no weapon for Formed against our campus, our church family will prosper. Father, you have the victory, and you we have the healing, and we declare healing in our body, in our church body, in the members' body, and we ask for the supernatural intervention of the Holy Spirit to show up in the hospital rooms, to show up in the bedrooms, and those that are even watching online, show up in their bedroom and heal the captive and heal their body. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, 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 and amen. Wow, wow, let's give the Lord a hand. Awesome. Awesome, you may be seated. And stay in that same spirit of prayer as you go throughout the whole week. You know, things happen to people and things happen to this church family. Uh, once again, I'd like to thank uh, Pastor Dan, Pastor Jessica, Pastor Luke, and the founders, Pastor Jim and Deborah, who are the fathers of this house, for giving me the opportunity to speak on this platform. I take it very, very seriously. I take what God has given us very seriously, and I consider it a privilege. Tonight, we're going to be talking about one word that leaped in my spirit when they said, will you give a message? And one word showed up, and on that I built what you're going to hear. And the word it was expansion. Expansion. Now, if I look at what we see today as the universe, I'm not a science scientist. I'm not a science guy. I think it's amazing. I look at the pictures. I look at the space. I look at the cosmos, and I wonder. But I don't know how to do any of the science. Uh, I, you know, I don't know how to do any of the formulas. I just know that if you go to L.A. and Griffith Park, there's a big old telescope, and if you dial in, you will see some amazing things like the universe. The Bible declares that the universe was made by God and that God in the heavens says this in Isaiah, he spanned it out like a curtain. We have a couple of telescopes the United States does that are up there right now that are taking some high uh, density pictures, high-end pictures, and they're downloading them to us. National Geographic just unloaded a slew of them. And these pictures are blowing my mind. One of them I have right now. And this picture right here is the snapshot, somewhere right there, of the universe. Now, when you look at the universe, and this is what science say, I'm not a scientist, I'm a guy that's just going to deliver the gospel. I don't know Greek. The only Greek I know lives down the street. I'm not into that. I don't know that. Here's what I do know. The Bible says that the span and the span and expansion of the universe is designed by God. As a matter of fact, if you look at the book of Isaiah and you take a look at what Isaiah has to tell us, Isaiah 40:22 says, and the Lord sits in the circle of the earth in the inhabitants like a grass, where we sit like a grasshopper, that the Lord stretched out the heavens as a curtain and spread it out like a tent. That's amazing to me because these pictures are showing that there's thousands of millions of galaxies. We're in one galaxy. There's millions of other galaxies that are out there, they're saying. That's how big God is. God is not a puny God. God is not a little God. God is a big God that creates universes. It really, it really um, 
discourages me when I hear people talk about God as he's down to their level. I want to just say something right now. God is not on our level. He's not on your level. He's not on my level. He's not on our level. If the God we know from the book of Isaiah can create the universe as a tent, that's a massive big God. And I'm but a puny little speck in this grand scheme of what God is doing with among us. What I want to take away tonight for you and deposit in your spirit is this big God is a God of expansion. This big God is a God of big things. This big God is a God who now creates things on his own. We can't figure that out. Scientists can't fathom how he does this. They guess a lot, and most of their guesses are wrong. When we really look at what the Bible describes as big and large, then you look at something like that picture, and it humbles us that the God of creation could be so big and so massive and so wonderful, yet is in concern for me and you and our little tiny problems. <laughs> little tiny problems, you say. Sometimes the expansion is necessary. Sometimes we're in a tight spot. Pastor Luke, Pastor Dan have been preaching about the the sea, where your back up is against the wall. Pastor Luke preached today where now you're facing the wall of Jericho. It was an awesome message. If you weren't here so this morning, you need to download it. It was amazing. Yeah. Pastor Dan and Pastor Luke are carrying the mail at this house, and they're doing a wonderful job in executing what God wants for you. The walls of Jericho were a symbol of to us that God can destroy anything. But sometimes overgrowth is actually funny. When we look at some things, I found these things online, and they're just, I don't know how people do these things, but they do these things. Maybe transportation in other areas of the world are a little tight, like the bus that you see right here. This is a little bu or bus or a train, actually, that's full of people that this is how they travel in India. When you look at that, I'm like, where does everybody fit? This is a bike that's actually too small. Now, when I was in Nicaragua, I actually seen that. There's a load of stuff that's way too big for the truck. It's funny. How did they do that? What I like is the cow there next to it. What is... What is that about? <laughs> Here's my point. Sometimes overgrowth is necessary. And in the kingdom of God, God's a big God. And what he wants from you and what he wants from me is always to stretch us to where the capacity that you can't do it, but by trusting God, he can do it, where it makes himself amazing yeah. and shining. When we look at what these things describe, you can take that off. Overload pictures are funny. Hebrews said this, and Pastor Luke ended with this, and I'm going to spring off this. Hebrews 10.35 says, Therefore do, do not cast away your confidence, for it's a great reward, for you are in need of endurance, that after you've done the will of God, that you may receive the promise. The promises were those that believed in a big God. The promises were for those that those were stretched even to the stretching of death. If we read the Hebrews 11, and they'll get to it, I think, in three or four years, they'll finish it somehow, okay? When you see that, you see the amazing individuals, which really Hebrews chapter 11 is the only chapter in the Bible that declares the faith of man. And it de declares it in such a way where their faith in God was almost supernatural, and it was. And their faith was stretched 
Their God dreams were stretched. Their missions were stretched because they believed in a God of expansion. They believed in a God that was more than themselves. They believed in a God that was so supernatural. He even said, if I die, bury my bones into that promised land, Moses said. Do you understand how big that is? It becomes not about them. It becomes about how big a God is inside of them. So there's three things that we were going to see tonight on expansion. God growing you, God growing us, to God growing his church. Those three things I'm just going to focus on. God growing you, God growing us, and God growing his church. First point, God growing us. What does that mean? I found a cool scripture in, in Ezekiel, chapter 34, verses 11 and 12. This really is the heartbeat of God. This is the heartbeat of God. Look at it. Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11, 12, and 16. It says, the sovereign Lord says this. You want to know who God is? Let's look at the Bible. And here's what the Bible says to you, and here's what the Bible says to me. I will search for my sheep, and I'll look after them. As a shepherd looks for a scattered flock, I will search for them. So I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them in the places where they've been scattered on the day of dark clouds and darkness. I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. I will bind up the injured, strengthen the weak, and I will shepherd the flock with justice. What an amazing scripture that God goes after people. That means he goes after you and he goes after me. The mandate of Jesus, he's one that showed up that he said, I'm about my father's business and I'm going after people. The heartbeat of God is he's going after the lost, he's going after the confused, he's going after the recluse, he's going after the strays, he's finding them and bringing them back home. He's protecting them, he's doing something that no one else can do. Breaking Free 2.0, you've seen it, it was, a little, it was a little blip on there, I don't really like myself on screen, but they made me to film myself. Breaking Free 2.0 is a continuation process of breaking free. Breaking free deals with the individual of the person, but in this house, there was a message that Pastor Jim continued to preach long ago now. He hasn't preached it in a while, but when I showed up to campus, to this house, I heard it, and it made my heart melt. Father to the fatherless. It's an historic founding message to this church. That this church has the mandate of Jesus to father the fatherless. Those that have been lost, those that are confused, those that need a way in and, and shooing those the, the, from the wolves that are deceiving them. The father to the fatherless is the foundation message of this church. So we latched on that on 2.0. And we said father to the fatherless is a premium and a mandate in this church. But it isn't only for this church. That message is for the world. I don't know if you've noticed when you see the reports and you look at the news, there is a disconnection from anybody. We're the most connected individuals on the planet and we have no connections with nobody. We have the cell phones, we have the iPads, we have instant chat, and no one knows you, but everybody likes you. <laughs> How does that work? I even read a caption of a poor guy who actually, she was at a funeral, and some lady walks in, and walks into the funeral home, and there's nobody there. And it was so sad. And the lady says, you know, I am so sorry for John. And I can't believe it because he had 500 Facebook followers and likers, but nobody's here. We live in that world of touching a computer screen is a connection. Really? 
That's not a connection. That's touching a computer screen. God invests himself in you to connect with you and to be a part of his kingdom and to be a part of this grand scheme of restoration. So what we've decided to do is take that to a new level. We're saying that God is about families. God is about generations. God is about saving the lost, but your children's children's children will be blessed in the house of God. That's a bigger scheme of things. This is massive. God wants to heal and restore people. God wants to set the captives free. When we see how God prepares people, he actually does these things. I want to show you what he does. Preparing you does this. When you ask God to prepare me, here's what he's going to do. He's going to stretch you. And you're not going to like it. You're going to be tested. You're going to be challenged. Here's where. Here's where we're at, actually. Here's where you're going to be challenged. Most of us are creatures of habit. You pick your seat. You like your seat. You sit there every time. Here's the testing. You're going to come to a church service. You know you're running late, and you're walking through the corridors, running to your seat, and all of a sudden, someone sat in your seat. Even though we don't have assigned seating, we can sit anywhere. My God, there's all kinds of seats, but yet now you're tested. Why is this lady sitting in that seat? Doesn't she know who I am? Don't they know me? Don't they know my credentials? My God, I graduated from the Rock School of Ministry. I do have these things. I aced Mr. Dr. Adams' test. Doesn't she know? Doesn't she know? You're tested with family. You're stretched with family. Here's what they say. What kind of good Christian are you? Who are you? How come you don't love the family? How come I don't see you? Well, maybe because the last time I showed up, all you guys were drunk and didn't even notice me. This is what I'm talking about. When God calls you, he calls to expand you. He calls to stretch you. He's going to put you in some most uncomfortable positions alive. Because we like the comfort zone. We like the safe zone. We like, okay, don't touch me, don't look at me, nothing matters. Let me just leave me all alone. You know, Pastor Luke said he's, and I, pretty much he likes to be isolated. I do too, Pastor Luke. I don't know why it is. It just is. Uh, when I'm shopping somewhere, I don't want someone looking through my groceries. I, 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 I don't need any looky loose. That makes me very, very uncomfortable. And I, I'm a pastor here, so I have to be nice. Be nice. God bless you. I had one guy, literally one guy was just staring at me as I was in the checkout counter. And you know how you could feel people looking at you? I felt like the heebie-jeebies, kind of like, what's going on? I mean, I know this guy who's checking me out. And there's an individual looking at him. How you doing? Where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. I'm like, really? Are you serious? Here, here, here I was tested. Here was the test. The test was to be nice. <laughs> Serious. Because I didn't like to be nice in that situation. Dude, you're making me very uncomfortable. And I'm freaking out right now. Right now, I feel like taking what I bought and throwing it at you. But I know you're going to call the church and you're going to say, Pastor Joel called and he was out of control. That's why he's the breaking free pastor. I knew it. <laughs> when God calls us, he doesn't want to leave us alone like we are. He wants to stretch us. And right now, some of you are being stretched. Your faith is being stretched. Our church family is hurting, so we're being stretched. Stretching is a part of the process. And being uncomfortable in these situations is a part of the process. When you look at what the Bible says, he looks at these things and the Lord declares 
things put in motion. 1 Samuel 17, I love the story of David. And here's why I love the story of David. David was a real guy to me. He, he, he was a really, he was a real man's man. You know, although he probably could sing and I can't, and he could play the harp and I can't. He can't do, I can't do a lot of things he was. He was a king, I'm not. I am a king and priest in the Lord, but I'm not a king. But he was tested in Samuel 17. And the test was this. As he was doing things behind the scenes, God was putting in motion a victory that he set him up. And there was a setup where David was stretched. And everybody around David was stretched. And the kingdom of God was being stretched with this big monster beast called Goliath. And he was in the way. And we see in Samuel 17... David launches out on this dialogue of how he heard there was somebody taunting God and his people, taunting the Lord and, and taunting his people. And he said to himself, I'm going to do something about it. So he came, and verse 36 says, for 36, your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this in uncircumcised Philistine is just like one of them because he has defiled the armies of the living God. Verse 37 says, The Lord rescued me from the paw of the lion and the, I mean the, and the paw of the bear and res rescued me from the hand of the Philistine. Saul said to David, Then go, the Lord is with you. Before God stretched him externally, he had already stretched him internally. Yeah. Yeah. David believed in that there was no match for the God of Israel, and there's no match when God's on his side. Sometimes, my friend, we struggle. We struggle because before David became a fighter in the field, he was, uh, before he became a warrior in the front line, he was already a fighter in the field. He was already, he was already testing his faith with these little animals. I don't know about, I don't know about you, but I don't, know, I don't know about fighting a bear. I don't know about fighting a lion, but David did. So he already had the faith inside of him. So when he seen this big beast, it was no match for the God that he's already in him. Before God can now use you, he has to get it out of you. And, before, and how he gets it out of you is to stretch you. Everyone wants to change circumstance. Everyone wants to see the circumstance change. But no one wants to change inside to get that circumstance. And the internal change is what David had. He had it inside of him. There was someone that was now getting him angry, and that someone has to be defeated. And if I defeated this one, and I defeated this one, then this guy's no match for me. Let me at him. Do you understand? Some of us want the front line. But we want to do nothing in the field. And Pastor Deborah has always challenged this church to pray. Nothing happens without prayer, she would say. It's one of her life messages. What you want to come to fruition has to be done in the privacy of your war that you're warring individually as a person of Jesus. Person of Jesus wars before the victory comes. Person of Jesus hears God and does it before anything happens. Person of Jesus contends and pleads. Pastor, I don't know how to pray. It doesn't matter. You can say, God, I need your help. And I need you to show up and I need you to intervene because my back is against the wall. I, I, I need you to show up. I need you to intervene because I don't know how to do this. People are calling me stupid and I don't know. I don't have what it takes, but you're with me and I know you're going to help me. 
And you're warring, you're warring, you're warring against those voices in your head that have cursed you. You're warring against those voices in your head that said you can't do it. I'm telling you, when David countered, encountered that, that Goliath, he already knew he was dead before he even stepped onto the game. That guy's done. Well, that comes with a relationship with King Jesus. And that King Jesus delivers you from the hand of the enemy. If it's in you, if it's in you, God will grow it out of you. And if you're not willing to fail, you won't succeed. We're at a time right now in America... We're at a time with our culture. We're at our time with the church. And if we don't sink in and hunker down to what Jesus is telling us, we're going to lose. And we're going to lose ground, and we're going to lose people, and we're going to lose the mission and the focus. Somewhere we think, especially the church world, that just leave us alone, let us be nice, let us be cute, let us be relevant, and we're going to conquer Goliath. You're not. The culture is going to swallow you up and spit you out, and is going to spit your kids out. And what this church will never do is bow down to the culture and bow down to the messages and bow down to the liar that has cursed humanity. Uh, one of these reasons why I love The Rock is because it's a fighting church. We just like to fight. We like to fight. I mean, I, I have my beautiful wife. We're celebrating 29 years of marriage next week. Pastor Joanna. I, I, I thought I was a fighter. I married a fighter. And she's a fighter that fought battles before we were even married. And she was a fighter that had fought battles for our family. And the reason why she married me is she was fighting in the heavenlies for a righteous man to come into her life. I didn't, she didn't know that I was going to stretch her like crazy <laughs> and make her crazy. But when we go to bed at, light, at night, here we rest our head with this. Jesus, you got it. Jesus, you're in control. Jesus, you're going to win. And we're going to fight to the bitter end. We know no end. It's no end, folks. It's a fighting church. It's a warring church. It's a praying church. It's a church that demands something from you. And that kind of church will change you and save you and save your children. Because we're not going to back down. For God to do something in you, he has to do something to you. God wants to grow you. What does he want to do? He wants to grow others. Thessalonians says this. Thessalonians chapter 5 says this. That we recognize and comfort each other with these edifying words. We urge you, brethren, to recognize those that labor among you. And the Lord admonish you, esteem you highly. Those that have been, you'll be stretched and tested. Tony, come here. So not only God wants to grow us, God wants to grow each other. This is how he does it, usually. There is no an island, no one exists independently. We are a church, we are a living organism. So when we lock arms, we can stretch further and faster than ever before. I can get to areas that he can't. He can get to areas what I can't. But we need to be knitted together in Christ. You're not autonomous. You're not by yourself. You're not isolated. Oh, I'm just going to get a church. I just hope everybody leave me alone. <laughs> it's not a good prayer because someone's going to come alongside of you, like maybe one of our SPTs, like Velma, and light your world because she's going to say, Oh, God's blessed and heaven's blessed. Hallelujah. <laughs> and she'll turn your world upside down because where she's going, she's fighting the kingdom, but she's doing it together. We're not alone. The Bible says that we're knitted in the hearts of Christ and two cords stranded together aren't easily broken. And that cord is just not a cord of strength. It's a cord of distance. 
We need you. Thank you, Tony. And you need us. And we need each other. Because I can't do it alone. You can't do it alone. But when the church comes together and loves on each other and finds hope and finds place in this house, there could be now distant stretch to your family members. Amen. When I showed up to the hospital for our dear sister, Dolores, and I didn't know what I was going to encounter. I walked in to this room full of about 25 to 27 family members. And, and, and I'm walking in, and I'm saying, okay, I'm ready to war, I'm ready to fight on, on, on her behalf, Deborah, I'm sorry, Deborah Sanchez, and I'm ready to war. And, and the family members walked in, and they said, her daughter's on the way, Pastor, we want you to pray for us, can you wait till that happens? And I said, yeah, sure. So I knew all eyes were, were going to be on me. And inside of me, I was saying, you know, this, here again, this makes me feel very uncomfortable. Everybody looking at me. But I had something inside of me that I had to deliver. I had to give, deliver the good report. Here was the good report. I, I know your mom. I know your sister. I know your auntie. And here's the good report. She's going to live and not die. Here's the good report. I come to you in the name of Jesus that you're not warring by yourself. I come to you in the name of Jesus that we love her. Jesus loves her. And all the investment and all the seed that she planted in the ground of the rock is going to now grow. Hear me, hear me. There was all of a sudden a community that locked arms by faith because now the expansion grew both of us and all of us. When we come in this community called the church, that community now expands the word of God to you and to me, where then God now is the one that we're worshiping, and he's helping all of us out, and we're helping each other out. I didn't know coming on staff that there was a couple of things that really, really rocked my world. I mean, I thought I was okay. I knew at Bible college, okay, I get that. I was a product of the church. I grew up as a pastor's kid. I knew all that. But when they said, your job is to do hospital visits, I said, what? Hospital visits? Okay, I'll do hospital visits. I didn't know that that was going to change my heart. Because in that hospital where there is no hope, if you come faithless, the enemy is going to kick you out of there and say, get out of here. I don't want you around here. When I showed up, I started to feel for the people. I started to cry for the people. I started to say this to myself. I'm going to put myself in that guy's place. And if I was strapped to a bed and wires, would I want someone to come visit me? And if that person was going to come visit me, is he going to pray for me? The saddest things that I hear in the hospital, it's not the bad reports, because Jesus is over the bad reports. Is the beds that are aside from those hospital beds. One nurse said, Pastor, can you come over here? I said, what do you want, ma'am? She says, can you pray for that brother right there? That guy hasn't had a visitation in a month. I said, are you kidding me? Until we start hurting for those that we're not now connected. It's just not about us, folks. It's just not about you. It's just not about me. It's about the kingdom of God growing. And you don't have to be a pastor to do a hospital visit. You don't have to have an ordination. You don't have to have a qualification. You just got to be a warrior in God's army to say, I came to declare the mighty hand of Jesus to set the captives free. In the name of the Lord, I bless you. That's what it does to you. It binds you together. So number one, he stretches you. Number two, he stretches us. And number three, he stretches the church. The end game is the church. I agree with this statement, that the church is the hope of the world. The local church is the hope of the world. What are you talking about, Pastor? It is in the church. It is by the church. The whole world will be saved. 
The local church is the hope of the world. It is this safe place. It is this God-fearing place. It is where the declaration of the word of the Lord comes from. That is the answer, my friend. It is the church. Well, you know, I, I really don't like the church. Well, if you're a part of it, you better like us because in heaven, you're going to see us forever. I don't like that guy, Pastor Joel. He offends me. Well, hopefully I won't be offensive in church and in heaven, but I'm going to be jumping up and down because I don't care. You understand? Somewhere this big old disconnect has happened. We're building community. We're building people to build a church. When Jesus comes, he's looking for a large, expansive, growing, healthy, thriving church. That's what he's looking for. And to become the church, we need to start with us. We need to start with each other so we can become God's army for the world. That's the bigger picture. Growing the church is hard work. Most people have this angle. I'm here to grow my ministry. I'm here to grow my influence. I'm here for them to get me to preach. I'm here to grow my network. I'm here to grow my brand. Not. We're here to declare the Lord. We're here to declare the voice of the Lord. We're here to make him famous. We're here to grow the kingdom. That's my assignment. That's your assignment. That's our assignment. It's not having a larger church for large sake. More people, more salvations. More healing, more restoration. More cities to reach. More people to go after. The God is a God who is after that church. If you read the Bible and you read Revelation, you'll see the warnings. Those where the... They are love grown cold, where the light of the gospels has been stamped out, where they become irrelevant, where they started falling in love with themselves. And he makes a declaration on an indictment on the church, and he also makes a challenge to the church. You know, you've all left your first love. Let's not get there, folks. Our first love is Jesus Christ. Let's move past our issues and our drama to get where God wants us to be because it's not about us. Even though I'm a part of the church, God's kingdom is growing. And I want this kingdom to grow that's a part of us. So the local church is the goal of God growing his kingdom. That means you don't come just to sit and us minister to you, which we will, and we love to minister the gospel, and you'll get something out of this house every time. But you're not coming to sit. You're coming now to grow and to move and to stretch. Where God dreams are going to be birthed inside of you. Where things are going to be given to you, assignments and callings, that now you're going to be accountable. We're not just babbling. God is executing his plan for the rock uh, church of San Bernardino for the world. He's got you in mind. He's got me in mind. He's got God dreams to birth. Please don't look at, well, what's this guy talking about? Here's what I'm talking about. When we get up to heaven, we're going to have to answer. We're going to have to answer to what he want, has given us. Will we now throw him the crowns and the jewels? Will we give him what God wants? Matthew said this, where he asked this question to Peter. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? And some say, you're the Messiah. And he said, upon you, Peter, verse 18, upon you, Peter, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. The church will not die because of man. Oh, my God. Thank you, Jesus. The church will grow. You will grow. I'll grow, but I need to be stretched. Where's God stretching you at? Where are you at in your own little world? Well, you know, it seems like God doesn't pay attention to me because I pray and nothing happens. Really? God listens to prayers. And he's going to bring people and things your way. We're talking about angel visitations just this morning. I believe in angels, and I believe angels visit people. That's what the Bible says. Quick little story, and I'll end with this. My uncle, 
who uh, was 20 years military and made a career out of it, was in Vietnam. My uncle, Ernest, was at the height of the war. He turns around and in a foxhole, he sees his friend being blown to pieces, disintegrated. He said this, he said, when I ran over there, I looked in that foxhole and there was just a big hole and those body parts everywhere. And I, I was just yelling at the guy and talking to the guy and all of a sudden he disappeared. And my heart, he said, just broke. And I lost it. To see a buddy that I was talking and then all of a sudden disappeared. Here's what he said. He jumped out of that foxhole. He looked around. He was incoherent because he was losing it emotionally. If you've seen that, you'd do the same thing, if not worse. Some guy from the periphery comes by, and he had a big old badge on, and the badge said, medic. And here's what he said. He said, uh, he called him by his name. He said, Mr. Mendez, your buddy's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. And he says, oh, yeah, but my buddy was here. He said, Mr. Mendez, he's going to be fine. But, but, but you don't know. I was just talking to him, and all of a sudden, he's not there. He says, Mr. Mendez, it's going to be okay. And he put his hand on his shoulder, and he tapped him. And all of a sudden, his spirit got quiet. About three minutes later, the sergeant of the army comes around. And he says, hey, Mendez, pick up all your stuff. We're leaving. He goes, yeah, I know, man. We've got to get out of here because I'm going to disintegrate and blow up like my buddy did. He goes, yeah, I feel sorry for him. He goes, but thank you for sending that medic. And here's what that sergeant said. What medic? There's never been one around. We can't get one to the front lines. I've been asking on the radio for hours to get somebody here. No one like that has showed up. I don't know who you talked to, but I don't know he's around. I believe that was an angelic visitation where God shows up and now does supernatural things on your behalf. When the church becomes the church, he stretches us so much to where we have God encounters, supernatural invitations, supernatural investments. All of a sudden, when you have a bill needing paid, all of a sudden you open up the mailbox and you go, man, where did that come from? That was Jesus. All of a sudden, when you're, you're broke or your family's broken down, there's an inv invasion of the Holy Spirit and shows up and brings restitution or, or security to your family. All of a sudden, somebody at school is talking to your daughter. Somebody at school is talking to your son. All of a sudden, there's someone in that high school that actually cares. Those are God interventions. When we see the grand scheme of things, God now shows up to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail. God wants to expand you by growing you. God wants to expand you by growing others. God wants to expand you by growing his church and you are a part of it and I'm a part of it. Did you get anything out of it? Today? All right. Awesome. Now, I can't go on without knowing that all you guys are okay. Five months ago, right down the street from us, there was a Christmas party that was in motion. And five months ago, this Christmas party turned deadly and violent and 14 people lost their lives. Right here in San Bernardino, you know the story. Terrorist attack. To assume you're right with God is a false assumption. No one had a clue that day showing up to that party, taking those selfies on the Christmas tree that they would be dead within the hour. Not one of them. We got to hear the stories. We got to cry with some of the families. We got to serve some of the families. It's a heartbreak. To assume you're right with God and you're going to go to heaven is a false assumption. You might say, Pastor, I've been brought up in church and, you know, I know the church. I've visited the church. Nowhere in the Bible does it say visiting the church or knowing about the church or knowing of the church gives you the right to go to heaven. Heaven, the Bible describes, are those to those that believed and received Jesus Christ 
but there's a lot of false assumptions. You could say, I'm good. I'm a good guy. I've met a lot of good guys, really wonderful guys, people that will help you carry your load, people that will look for you, call you, people in work that are going to challenge you, but yet they'll be there as personal friends. Nowhere in the Bible that we, see, we say that goodness will take you to heaven. Nowhere. We can't read it nowhere. There are plenty of good people in the Bible that went to hell. Nowhere. Pastor, I've been baptized in my church. I was a part of the church. You know, I, I was ushering. I was doing things. Nowhere in the Bible, because you're an usher or because you're a part of a team or you are a part of a ministry long ago, that get guarantees you salvation. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you're going to be saved by going to church, being a part of a church, and being in that mission of that church. Nowhere in the Bible. Matter of fact, the Bible declares something different. There was a man that was better than you, better than me, better than all of us. His name was Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus in John chapter 3 declared one message and heralded it very, very loud and clear. He was good, he was righteous, he was a servant, he was a leader, but he didn't know God. He had all the qualifications, but he was going to miss heaven because he was missing Jesus. So Jesus challenged him, and I challenge you tonight, that don't assume that you're going to get to heaven like Nicodemus, because Jesus asked Nicodemus, that I'm going to ask you a question. Are you born again? Born again, Pastor, I've heard born again. I've heard it from the media. I've watched TV. These guys in these white suits, they say they're born again. They're all about money. They're all about charlatans. They're all about promotion and self. That's not born again to me. I read the Bible. The born again says where you give you God all your heart, all your mind. You give everything. You're done with you. You're ready for God. You're ready to be born again. This is what you're saying tonight. I'm done with my plan and my agenda, and I want God's. This is what you're saying tonight. I'm done with my silly nonsense and my religiosity because I wore jewelry or I was a part of something that I thought was bigger than myself or because I, I, I sewed into wells of Africa or because I was around and I got it hooked up to this organization that put shoes on everybody. I'm glad and I'm happy that you were able to do that. But listen, you don't go to heaven by those things. You go to heaven by what the word of God declares. And here's what the word of God declares. Jesus said this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. One way, one Jesus, one salvation. Please don't put yourself up like you're assuming. One of the letters that we got a while ago now was from prison. And here's what the letter wrote. Pastor, I'm writing you this letter because I went to your church. I never walked down the aisle. And before you know it, I got in a scuffle right after church, and I killed a cop, and now I'm in prison forever. Tell the people this, and this is what he said. Tell the people this in this letter. Tell them, don't miss the opportunity like I did, because that opportunity might only come once. Here's what I'm telling you, folks. Don't assume that you're saved. Here's what I'm telling you. You're not going to make it if you're on your own. Jesus asks, and he says this, I am the way, the truth, and the life. That life is coming. But here's what I want you to do. I'm going to ask something from you. Here's what I'm going to ask. Everyone that Jesus called, he called publicly. He called them out to the declaration of who do they say that I am. And Peter said, thou art the Christ, son of the living God, to the declaration that I need the Lord. I'm going to ask something from you. And here's what I'm going to ask from you. A commitment to the master, Jesus Christ. But pastor, you don't know my condition. You're talking about stretching, man. I'm really stretched right now. I'm, 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 I'm at my wit's end. Here's what I'm asking you. God can take care of that. God wants to save you. But you need to believe and receive what the Bible calls salvation. Salvation is not an independent thing. You can't save yourself apart from Jesus. So here's what I'm going to do. All throughout the auditorium, I'm going to clap my hands. I'm going to go, one, please, no one moving around. Already two or three people already moved around. Please, just respect the house of God. I'm going to count. When I count, I'm going to 
bang this Bible. When I bang this Bible, if you're running from God instead of to God, I'm calling you out. If you're not sure, be sure. If you're running from, you need to write run to. One, don't assume. Two, don't overthink and don't think that you can be saved apart from Jesus. Three, raise your hand. Anybody in this house, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? It's your day of salvation. God is calling you right now. You're being stretched. You're being maxed out. God wants to rescue you, my friend, right here. Anybody else? Anybody else? Anyone else? I've seen three or four people. Is there anybody else? If you're feeling a prompting and say, you know what? I'm not sure. Be sure. If you don't know, no. Raise your hand right now. It's not by accident. You're right here at the right time, at the right place. So God is declaring salvation to you, my friend. All right. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? How about on this side? Everybody okay? Thank you. Anybody else? Anybody else? God wants to save you, not the church. Jesus wants to call you. He's looking for the sheep that are lost. He's looking for the destitutes. He's looking for the lonely. He's calling you out. Anybody else? Anybody else? All right. All right. Here's what I'm going to do. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to stand up. And when you stand up, do something very courageous and very bold, but very faith-driven. Here's what I mean. I'm going to ask you to stand up, and those that raise their hand, I want you to come up to the front with me right now. Come right now. Church, will you rise? Will you come right now? All those who raise their hand, out from that side to this side, raise your hand. Come now. Come right now. Come right now. Come now. Stand right in front of me. Yes. Come, 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 come. Come, 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 come. Awesome. Awesome. Come, come, come now. Come. Here's what I want to say to you. God handpicked this day to save you. God called you out by name and he knows your purpose and he knows your destiny and he has a plan for you. It's no accident you're here at this time. God's no respecter of persons. But here's what we pray at this church. Lord, that they just don't come and get saved, that they get radically saved and that you get really plugged into God. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to offer you three things. Here's the three things we offer. We offer you a connection with God where you now are connected with him, Jesus himself saving you. A connected connection with each other we call SPTs, friends that have come alongside you to help you out, pray for you. They don't throw you under the bus. They make you feel welcome and they want to embrace you, sit down with you. And then what we offer is a connection with the community, us, to be a part of this church. So if you don't have a church, let this be your church, because this is a healthy church. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to introduce you to a friend of mine. His name is Antonio. See this guy? He's a really, really nice guy, especially when he's asleep. He's very nice when he's asleep. <laughs> that guy is going to introduce you to what I just shared with you. So I want you to do this. Turn left to Tony, and Tony will give you that information. Give them a hand. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.